we've become so disconnected as a result of that disconnection, our nervous system is like upside down. And most of us are almost always in a, paras in a sympathetic, we're almost always in a sympathetic rhythm, which means fight or flight. Welcome to Radically Loved Radio. I am your host, Rosie Acosta, yoga teacher and teacher trainer, mindfulness coach, speaker, and creative writer. I am also the founder of radicallyloved.com, a website where you can go for more information about yoga, mindfulness, meditation, and lifestyle advice. On this podcast, we talk to people within our health and wellness community that are creating content through the ritualistic practice of yoga, meditation, or overall mindful living. We hope to create value in your life so that you can achieve your highest potential and live a radically loved life. To stay in touch with us, just follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Rosie Acosta and on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie. You can sign up for our newsletter on radicallyloved.com to stay up to date on future workshops, retreats, and latest podcasts. This podcast is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. I have been waiting for months for this product to come out and it's finally here, the Four Sigmatic Mushroom Focus Shot. Four Sigmatic has always believed in seeking energy through nutrient-dense foods, sleep hygiene, movement, and hydration. So when they came up with this product as an alternative to all those gnarly energy drinks that are out there, I was so excited. This is the first ready-to-drink product that promotes focus and energy without all the gnarly ingredients. You can sip half of the bottle of Lion's Mane and Guayusa with a powerful pineapple taste from only real ingredients. No artificial sweeteners or flavors are allowed. I can drink half of the bottle in the morning and then half in the afternoon, and it doesn't make me feel weird and jittery in the afternoon. Go to foursigmatic.com and use the promo code radically loved. That's R A D I C A L L Y L O V E D to get a special discount on all the Four Sigmatic products. Back to our show. Hey, listeners, we need your support. Help us by subscribing and rating to this podcast. Send us a snapshot of your review or comment, and we will send you a very special Radically Loved gift. Send your comment to info at radicallyloved.com. You can also click on the show notes here on this podcast for more information. If you want to be part of our community, please click the link to our private Facebook group, on the show notes of this particular podcast so you can be the first to hear of upcoming trainings, retreats, and special Radically Loved events. Thanks so much for listening. Yoga Rupa Rod Stryker is world-renowned yoga and meditation teacher, guiding and sharing his wisdom for the last 40 years. He is the founder of Para Yoga, the author of The Four Desires, Creating a Life of Purpose, Happiness, Prosperity, and Freedom. And he's also the creator of the most comprehensive online yoga teacher training in the world, and most recently, the app Sanctuary, a premier destination for all levels of those who are wanting the experience of the life-changing practices of meditation and yoga. Yoganidra, also known as Enlightened Sleep. Rod Stryker is not only one of the most enlightened people that I've ever come into contact with, but he's also my teacher. I was fortunate enough to catch up with him at the Lead with Love conference in Aspen, which we both taught at. And I was finally excited to actually get him on the show. Many of you who have been listening for a long time know that he has been so instrumental to me as a yogi and as a yoga teacher and i'm so excited to share this conversation that we had we talked about the importance of creating ritual and all the different ways that we can incorporate yoga and meditation to cultivate our own inner sanctuary here's a conversation with yoga rupa rod striker so i think that i, I like what we were talking about yesterday hmm. um the conversation about not only just the disconnect that we have with having human to human contact and sort of this loss of experience with being present. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on what being present means first off. And then um, 
you know, just the digital age that we live in now, you know, you're also a parent, you're a teacher, you have thousands and thousands of students. I'm, I'm just curious as to what, what is your feeling about where we are in our current state of affairs? You know, I get my feeling about what's going on, not so much based on my learning as a student of yoga for 40 some odd years, but it's more about just what are the facts and what's the level of stress and what does anxiety look like? What are the, you know, the statistics related to depression and, and, uh, and suicide? I mean, these are all time highs. So forget what I've learned through yoga because I don't want to just assert that. I want to just say, look, something's not working. And is there stuff that the yoga tradition can tell us that can help uh, us find solutions? Because clearly the statistics are incredibly alarming. I mean, and, and, and they're so, so what we want to do is we want to begin to look at where are their solutions? Where are these pain points? What are the sources of those pain points? And how do we begin to resolve them? And we can make the case about technology for sure. I mean, it's really good, you know, just starting from scratch, it's really good just to step back and realize that all the technology that's being developed that I know of, that, that has become like an appendage, like we absolutely, it's indispensable. I mean, not having your phone for three hours, it's like almost unimaginable, right? <laughs> but the point is that the people are developing those technologies that we use and that are, are, not, in, are not in the business of making us hel- healthier and happier. They're in the business of making money. And the things that we've become so invested in that are so indispensable are really tools for companies and entrepreneurs to make money. They're not helping the health and well-being of this current generation and future generations to come. And so what we have to do is be a little circumspect. You know, it's healthy to begin to say, uh, how much is this really helping me ultimately get to the place where I really want to be, which is more health, more happiness, more a sense of success and fulfillment and you know we can we can begin to look at the statistics and look at the i I just heard one yesterday that actually you know in terms of actual intimacy families now spend less time than the average person spends on netflix on a daily basis netflix viewing is about 33 minutes per day per person the amount of time we spend around a dinner table with no one distracted and actually having a conversation about feelings is less than 30 minutes. Now you take Netflix and then you add Facebook or Instagram and then you add all the other social media or all the other kind of internet flow of news that we're engaged in. And you realize this is why there is this loss of fulfillment because it's it really comes down to our nervous systems in a sense. You know, We have the same nervous system as we did 30, 40, 50,000 years ago. And part of the way I nurtured my nervous system is I looked you in the eye and I touched your hand or I touched you as they do in a lot of countries outside of America and England. There's actually touching involved and it's totally platonic. It's just a way of contact. And that stimulates part of our nervous system, which makes us more sensitive to other people and makes us more sensitive to our own feelings. Like, what's the direction my heart is telling me to go? And the fact that I become more and more superficial and this part of my nervous system that reads feelings is becoming more and more atrophied tells us, begins to describe at least part of, or one of the contributors to why uh, we experience really the, the, the troubling symptoms associated to higher stress levels. Yeah. We're meant to connect. We're meant to sit around a fire and tell stories and look mm-hmm. at the stars and talk about yesterday and today together. Um, so, how, you know, what are the, I think part of what I want to talk with you about today at some point is that we get to, okay, well, those are, here are the realities. Let's not just get in this mire of depression about how it's going and what do we do about it? Uh, you know, we're depressed that we're depressed. That's, that's something we don't want to, uh, we don't want to engage in because it's kind of right. a, a it's vicious, a it's a, bo- a bottomless pit, yeah. downward spiral, yeah. So there are, luckily there are solutions, and this is where um, the resources of the traditions of yoga and things have really some, uh, and even bigger, uh, you know, kind of a bigger, bigger ideas. It's not just yoga, like moving in poses. There are some other systems uh, we've talked about, and you've practiced with me, Yoga Nidra, mm-hmm. 
which I think is going to be one of the godsends, one of the lifesavers for people in the next uh, next decades. I really do. I think this is going to be a big deal. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about why it's so effective? Because uh, it is, and I've not. There's not any other practice that I do uh, that's that that works that quickly and that efficiently like Yoga Nidra does. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for pronouncing it correctly. You know. Um, I have uh, to. You're my teacher. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. I <laughs> get in I, trouble. I, I, we drill down into that. <laughs> so it's often mispronounced as Nidra and it's Nidra. And so, you know, for those who are unaware of what it is, it's essentially we're putting two words together. One is sleep, that's Nidra, and the other is yoga, which one way of describing that would be awareness, a linking to something. Why is it so effective? Well, First of all, it's almost the, if you wanted to design the perfect antidote to some of the problems that we experience uh, in our lives. And, and a lot of this is really, again, our anatomy, our physiology meeting technology and meeting the modern age. Um, great, I mean, a vital concept is just to realize that it's only in the last hundred years or so that we have light bulbs, okay, light bulbs. That means that people went to sleep two hours after the sundown, and basically woke up within an hour or two of it rising. And by the way, that's directly in line with your circadian rhythms, right? The point being that we're now living almost completely separate from nature. And we've become so disconnected as a result of that disconnection. Our nervous system is like upside down. And most of us are almost always in a, paras in a sympathetic we're almost always in a sympathetic rhythm, which means fight or flight. And even though we're not fighting uh, saber-toothed tigers or we're not out there in the wilderness having to fight physically necessarily, stress at a job, a deadline, a lack of sleep, sufficient quality sleep, all of these things really start to add up. So yoga nidra, what it does is it takes all of what your nervous system is not getting in the modern day, and now it's providing the most, um, uh, the most efficient way to enter into the deepest rhythm of sleep. So an interesting statistic or, or kind of figure around this is that when we sleep eight hours, if we sleep eight hours, you only get about 20 to 25% of that time where you're sleeping deeply. That's deep, dreamless sleep. And uh, -sleep, you know, the science on that is, they call it uh, non-REM, stage three, deep sleep. You're not dreaming. You're in homeostasis. So that means if you sleep eight hours, you only get 95, 98 minutes, 100 minutes of that. So sleep's relatively inefficient when it comes to getting deep healing and repair. Now, what happens in yoga nidra is that you enter deep sleep ideally in five to 10 minutes. So that means if you do it for half an hour and you get 20 minutes, you've almost gotten the equivalent of two hours of deep sleep, of regular sleep in, in 20 to 30 minutes. There's also just, uh, you know, there's just an elegance and a genius around how methodical the steps are that lead you into physical relaxation and mental relaxation, then deeper and deeper into this place. I mean, you, you ask a great question, why is it so effective? And part of it is just, it's giving us something so unique. At the same time, it's aligning ourselves with the very ideal, the ideal conditions in which you are going to repair and renew, both physically and mentally, and we could even say spiritually. Yeah, I like the spiritually part a lot. Because yeah. for me, I felt that that was such a direct conduit to that uh, that bliss. I mm -hmm. felt, I mean, that's the only time that I can actually feel in that, in that state. Well, when I meditate, but it's just, it's different. It's different than meditation. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. But I'm, you know, I think that because people who correctly are looking for the benefits of meditation, but yet find meditation difficult, will find that same, that very thing they're wanting to access, they'll find it through yoga nidra. Mm. And it's yoga nidra, you're lying down, of course. And essentially the distinction between the two is through meditation, we get deeper through concentration. In other words, people who've meditated have heard this many times is 
if your mind wanders, just come back to the object you're paying attention to, be it mm -hmm. breath or whatever. In Yoga Nidra, it's the opposite. In, when you find yourself going deeper, it's because you're relaxing. So one is the result of higher levels and improved levels of concentration. The other is you're lying on your back and you're just learning to become effortless. Now that does require some skill and it mm -hmm. is something that we acquire over time. But I'm going to make the case that we can reach the very place you talked about, that place of bliss, or, and we can say more about what that spiritual experience is like, mm -hmm. by relaxing as opposed to trying to concentrate. Mm -hmm. And probably now more than ever, where we started the conversation about the technology, is so scattering our attention that to now go in and try and get totally clear and one pointed through meditation is like almost untenable we just can't where you grasp for concentration when all the rest of your waking state you're distracted yeah uh you know i i've what i've understood recently and this may or may not be true in all college campuses but a lot of college campuses evidently now what they do is because students are so compelled to text every 20 minutes or so and that's the out that's that's as much as they can go without texting professors actually break the class an hour class or an hour and a half class so kids can go text so they won't be distracted during class. That's how, and you know, that was news to me. Wow. So what it's telling us is we really can't hold attention very long. Therefore, Yoga Nidra in many ways is going to be um, a more uh, readily available kind of way to access this state of higher awareness. And, you know, I'm always one to try and ground these things in, in a kind of practical language. So what does that really mean to be spiritual? Because it does, you know, and you said that's kind of your favorite space for that. Um, what does that really mean to kind of be closer to your spirit? Yes, it is blissful. It is like the, the feeling of being as you're drifting off into deep sleep, but now you get to be aware of that feeling and it's sustained, that very, just between the waking state and the dream and the sleeping state, there's this moment where you're just hovering in this soft, blurry boundlessness and that's what yoga nidra allows you to enter but if we look at it more deeply um, it allows you to rest in that state but what is that state that state is the end of fear and now we're talking about like maybe the most pervasive uh, illness or dis-ease that we all have to have a physical body means you have some level of fear. To have a family or to have possessions or to have a goal or to have a good job, it, there's always some level of fear that those things are going to go away. We all walk with fear. You know, Every step of life, fear accompanies us like a shadow. But to enter that rhythm that you're talking about, Rosie, is really the rhythm of non-dual awareness where mm -hmm. you're no longer confined to this uh, a yoga teacher, a great yoga master used to call it I-ness and minus. So it's a feeling of I, I'm unique, and minus, like my stuff. So normally I always have this I-ness and minus until I fall asleep. It's like my stuff, my body, my thoughts, my possessions, my family, my goals, my vacation, my work, my thing. And now in that spiritual uh, like embrace or that resting state what you're feeling what you're experiencing is you're not you're not just your body you're not just your thoughts you're not just your things and you just expand into this boundlessness and that's really what i would tell people that it's it's ultimately not only is it blissful not only is it repairing you physically not only is it, not only is it antidote antidoting so much of what we experience in the modern day but we're really talking about something that gives you a glimpse of who you are without any fear. Yeah. Well, I, I love that you're speaking to it in, in those terms because, uh, you know, for me, a lot of it has been this inability to release tension. You, uh, you know how I grew up and the environment that I grew up in, and there was always a, a fear of safety, of feeling safe. And so these states were never anything that I had experienced up until maybe I was about 20 years old 
because there was always that uh, underlying tension. Even you can't rest. You can't even close your eyes because you're in living in that in that fear state. And so, what what I I would like to you know I know that you can speak to this. Obviously, um, the the healing benefits of of this particular practice and how um, this is utilized for people like myself and people you know we, we you. Uh, moderated a panel with the urban yogis, you know, that are doing this incredible work. And so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to just hear your thoughts on that. You know, I do know your background and, and, um, in that sense. And, uh, I even spoke to it on that panel where I, at one point in my teaching, when I still lived in Los Angeles, I went down and I taught in the inner city. I taught in the projects and it was, uh, an, uh, it was an eye opening experience for me in many ways. Um, Suddenly, of course, it wasn't. I wasn't. It wasn't distant. This whole idea of people, innocent people, actually being killed over territory and colors and things like that. And I was speaking to young people. I mean, I, I was. I was probably about thirty at my time at the time. But I, I was speaking to kids who were ten and twelve years old, who were losing relatives every week, and amazing. And just that thing you were saying, they couldn't even close their eyes when they came to relax, relaxation. So that's. It's worth us all being aware that that's a kind of privilege life we have that we can actually, if we are smart enough to take the time to relax, that we can actually do it. Imagine living in an environment where you can never let your guard down 100%. Uh, so so that, that's one piece. But I also at the same time want to say that for people who haven't grown up, which I didn't, I grew up in an upper middle class environment, uh, for people who haven't grown up in conditions that, uh, with that much, th- uh, where the threat of violence is constantly present, we also are afraid. So I had this really, one of the great experiences of my teaching life was teaching my grandmother before she, you know, she, well, she was still alive. And at one point, I led her into the practice. We kind of did some yoga. We did some postures and things like that. And I gave her some breathing. And, and, then, at the, and then I gave her shavasana. Uh, So she's lying on her back and I'm leading her deeper and deeper into relaxation. And I just, I just see this woman who's 85 years old, who's lived her whole life and she's never experienced what she's experiencing in that moment. And I, then we were done. I sat her up and I guided her into about three or four minutes of meditation. And it just got that much to, that was even got deeper and I could see her eyes were closed and she was starting to taste something. That And she'd had a very rich, very diverse life, not all of it easy, but still extraordinary life. And I realized that tasting that silence and the value of that flavor of resting in herself for the first time in her life, I could just sense the delight coming out of her. It's like she was experiencing it, but she was almost smiling because she was starting to know something that I think we all know, but she was actually experiencing it. And I, and I just, for me, I'm, I'm actually, as I'm saying it, I'm kind of moved because I realized that I gave her one more experience that she would not have, could not have found in the world. So I do want to make the point that even for someone not living under really significantly threatening, you know, doesn't have that background, we still walk with fear. And, um, uh, and the, these methodologies allow us to touch a part of ourselves that no amount of accomplishment or working outward is going to get us to. And uh, that's part of what makes it so special. Yeah. Thank you for, for speaking to that because I think, um, I think it's really important for people to know that, that we're all the same. We're all going through the same experience. Right. And I think just going back to what you said in the beginning about us cultivating that empathy with each other and how we're not doing that enough. Well, you, you said about, you know, the touch, but ultimately that's what it is, right? It's like, we're losing that ability to be empathetic because we're losing the connection with, with each other. And what is that doing with our own spiritual well being? Well, it's desensitizing us to the things that actually kept us healthy. So all the studies, there's never been a study that I don't think that's ever supported the conclusion that if there's love and contact and intimacy in your life, you live longer. There's never been a study to show that that's wrong. 
but it's authentic love it's connection it's intimacy it's appreciation it's it's vocabulary you have to express it and there's no question that it has that effect on human beings physiology uh the however what we're confronted with is this is that the endorphin hit i get from this incredibly valuable interaction called intimacy and if it's intimacy as a friend if it's intimacy as a lover it's intimacy between a parent and a child between a um, uh, a real connection between a student and a teacher and i'm just talking about just as people not sexual at all but they begin to enrich our physiology but on the other hand the endorphin hit that that provides is one one thousandth as one one thousandth as powerful as the endorphins you get from angry birds you get a thousand times bigger hit on most video games of endorphins which then create that addictive response now here's the thing and by the way social media most social media platforms the swiping situation and we all haven't that, even gotten to there yeah, yet but all of them have been engineered to generate endorphins they're literally engineered in the same way that McDonald's food scientists created uh, a unique taste profile that unfolded in a specific way, hitting specific parts of your tongue, created addictive, uh, kind of a, uh, actually triggered addiction to their food. So, uh, social media scientists have created, used similar kinds of engineering to coax our mind into addictive responses. So, but the real point I'm making is, your brain now gets so much endorphins through social media and video games. Multiples, I, I, the, the statistic I heard from a professor at, uh, at, at uh, MIT was one one thousandth the amount. Now what's happened is that your brain, in order not to OD on endorphins, desensitizes you. It produces desensitization neurotransmitters. So that means that at a certain point, if you play enough video games, that social contact doesn't give you any hit. Because you're now so dull, your sense, literally the, the, uh, the, uh, the things that perceive the, the endorphins being released are now caked in this desensitization material in your brain. And now, there's no wonder people, and, and you know, I know probably a lot of people listening to us talk right now, have sat with their friends and four or five or six of them are sitting around a table and they're all on the phone. I get it, but that's the science behind it. The science behind it is it's a bigger hit. But what we want, I think what I want to stress is understand that physiologically, psychologically, and emotionally, you'll pay a price for not having the, the, the value of intimacy and connection. And that's physiological. There's physiology, you know, there's physiological impact as well as emotional and psychological impact. So it begins to explain why, you know, if we should all just be really skillful about our choices related to these things. We all need them. But at one point is we just are just, are we, have we become addicted and starting to create these repercussions on these various levels? And I think all the research is also showing the more of it you use, the more unhappy you are. You know? Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, you've, you've spoke about this at length that as a Western society, we are not happy, yeah. right? We're just, we're yeah. not happy. Yeah. And so, and I feel like that that's becoming with with all the access to resources we have mm -hmm. online and self help books and apps that can coach you and all of these things. There's still that there is a, a market for it and a large market at that. And you know, I'm I'm for me, I think that the biggest thing that I sort of struggle with in in this world of technology that we live in is to learn how to create balance so that I can actually live my life in real life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I want to, I, if we can, I think we should take a turn. Cause is this starting to sound like a bummer? Are we, are we making, no. is this, this going to be the bummer <laughs> no, no, podcast? No, it's not. No, it's going to be yeah. awesome. Okay. Everybody but, loves it. People that, for you listeners, they, they love this stuff. They okay. love to get all the the juicy goods and the info and and they want to send it to all of their friends and people that could really benefit from knowing what we're talking about and there is there is hope in all this i mean yeah, you know and that's i i stand on that frontier between hope and reality the reality is we do a lot of stuff that is not good for us and it seems relatively innocent 
On the other hand, the hopeful side, if you just turn a little bit, there are methodologies. A lot of them are really old. They're super time-tested. And yoga nidra and meditation and the right kind of yoga. You know, there's, uh, so all of these things can really begin to make you more of an island of stability and steadiness and ease, even as the world is spinning like out of control around you. And, and in the same way I described my grandmother, this was pre-digital age. Well, my grandmother had been through a war and she had all her own kind of, you know, intense kind of ex experiences. And the solution was the same for her to find delight and peace and well-being. It's like you got to slow down. And uh, even though the environment was less stimulating in the 80s, uh, there was still plenty of things to get distracted on. It's not your own thoughts. So I'm, I'm always on that edge. I just try and, you know, have one eye on what's happening and the other eye on the other eye or what are the solutions to it? What are the solutions to yeah. what's happening? And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. If we have become desensitized to our own ability to assess whether we're well or not, how, how do we eradicate that? How do we even start to fix that? Wow. So, I mean, it's such a great question. So that's like either not trusting our ability to assess it or just like being oblivious. And... You know, so the first step is having some awareness. But you need, as you, I think your question implies, you need some things to reflect with so you can see where you were, you were at. Because a lot of us, I mean, what we could say is anxiety and depression are the new normal, right? So if I'm not super anxious to, the, to whatever degree, and I'm not super depressed to whatever degree, then I guess I'm normal. And what we would say is, well, hold on, before you really go there, let's look at a few basic things. <laughs> Number one, uh, number one really is sleep. One of the easiest ways to, ana to analyze where you're at on the scale of, you know, your nervous system being healthy, um, the foundation of well-being. There are really three, I, I consider it like this is the triangle of health, and really we could maybe do a square of health. So there's four sides. One is exercise, the other is nutrition. And the other is relationship, which we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is sleep. And sleep is, the value of sleep is totally underestimated. But let's look at sleep. First thing is, do you sleep, how well do you sleep? What's your sleep like? And if it's not, if you can't go to sleep easily, and if you don't wake up refreshed, then there's already, that's one of the first pathologies we should look at to assess whether or not we're balanced and we're kind of starting to lose our way and slip into some things. The other thing, and I make it really simple, I mean, digestion and elimination. What's happening there? Because it's not just what you eat, but your mindset when you're eating and your ability to digest and eliminate is also tied to what, you know, the condition of your nervous system. And uh, you, I think everyone's experienced that when you shift back into a rhythm of relaxation, your system flows better, you know? The next thing to really consider is it's relational. And the sense of how much how much joy is there in your life you know not not like i'm surviving but how much joy is there in your life one of my one of i think the most helpful ideas that we find in the yoga tradition is inherent in the word health so the word health in sanskrit is as ashta asta means um it literally means to be established in the self so healthy means that, and that's big S, by the way. That means soul or spirit. So if I'm healthy, I'm established in myself, soul, essence. If I'm not healthy, I'm not. What does that mean? It means that I have something to complain about. It means that something is hurting me, or I'm being hurt, or I'm hurting myself. When I'm established in the self, there's this lightness of being. There's this spontaneity. There's creativity there's possibility, there's imagination. You find, spontaneously find access to solutions. When I'm not established in myself, that's dis-ease. So now I have things to complain about. The less, and, and I'm, not talk, I'm not encouraging denial or repression, but what I'm saying is trace your thoughts, trace your language, you, the words you use, the extent to which you have things that you feel are, you have to complain about or to feel as though life is somehow being unjust or disruptive or unfair. 
it means that there's a certain lack of health because in health, we're in that spontaneously delightful, blissful self. And, you know, again, a simple example of that is I'm going along fine and I kind of forget I have a body. If I'm healthy, I don't remember I have a body. I get a splinter, I suddenly remember I have a body. I get a fever, I get an allergy, I remember I have a body. So that final piece I would just simply say is how much do you have to complain about? And it's important I make one distinction when I say that, and that is I'm not saying your life has to be perfect because life may never be perfect. So instead of having, uh, uh, having the kind of justification to complain about things that aren't, ha aren't really perfectly aligned to your best wishes, what we're talking about is resting in a kind of self-awareness, self-value, having kind of this inner integrity and connection to yourself such that your circumstances become less dominant. They, your circumstances are less influential in determining how you feel and how you think. So it's those very practical ideas. It's sleep, it's digestion, elimination, and then it's your kind of uh, complaint uh, 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 list. Oh, meter. Yeah, complaint your complaint meter. meter. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's really, those are really great, great uh, points to measure, I think. And, and that's really, if, if you're at sort of base camp and you don't know like where you're at on the spectrum, I think that's a great tool to give people to be able to measure that. Um, talking about measure, uh, in terms of creating healthy habits and ritual. I talk about ritual a lot on this podcast and I, and I love to ask guests about their ritual and how important it is in their life, if so. And I find that anyone who's ever achieved anything in their life has had some sort of ritual in their life. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, for you to speak on that, um, but I'd also like for you to share your, um, your thoughts on uh, patience and sustainability within that. Okay. I'll, That's I'll, like a big question. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, you got sustainability in there. What, what, what do you mean by sustainability? Well, so I guess, I guess the question is really, I guess it's twofold. What role does ritual play in your life and why is it important for you in particular? And the second is um, addressing the idea that we are in this world of instant gratification, that we get so uh, involved in, in the short term that we don't spend enough energy and attention or were even compelled to look at the long term. I was asked about my non-negotiables recently, you know, what are my non-negotiables? And I would say my morning ritual is my non-negotiable. And that's practice. And you know, I don't want listeners to feel discouraged by what I'm about to say or feel like they're, like I'm judging anyone who doesn't have my version of this. Again, we're at, we're talking about someone, myself, I've done this for 40 years. I didn't start where I am today. But uh, I do about a two and a half hour morning ritual around my practice. And uh, that means uh, over an hour of meditation. Now I could not do an hour of meditation 20 years ago. The Dalai Lama meditates for three hours, you know, so every day and my teacher does that too. So it's just a, a scale and you know, it's part of how you construct your life, et cetera. So I do that, I do about an hour of asana every day and. And, 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 and breath work and almost yoga nidra every day. So that means I get up around 4.30. Now, you know, I know that's not practical for a lot of people. But again, if you go back to what I described earlier, which is that if I get 45 minutes of yoga nidra, that's like I got an, a, an extra hour of sleep. So there's a little bit of, you know, it's, it's pretty strategic and it's not, I'm not being silly and I don't, given my work output, I, I'm not really a very tired person because of this morning ritual. And then, as I said to this person who asked the question about non-negotiables, that's my non-negotiable. My family kind of gets it, so I, show, I don't show up. I don't, I'm not there when my youngest kids wake up. I am there before they leave for school, and I help them get dressed and do all that. But 
I just finish around 7.15 and, and they're now just getting up and mom's making breakfast and all that. And so I make sure they get out and give them kisses and all that. But um, then the point is that if I have that, nothing else is non-negotiable. In other words, that's my non-negotiable. That means that I'm now in a position to accept life as it comes. And they said, you don't have any other non-negotiables? And I said, no. I mean, it's like at that point, I've so saturated myself in my needs, in taking care of my needs, physiologically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And now there's just life, and life is going to happen. And I have children, and I have a business, and I have a marriage, and I have... And so life is happening, and I can't stop life from happening. So now I have my... I've filled my cup in the morning, and all day long it's going to get really splashy, and a bunch of that water is going to fly out of the cup, and I'm going to fill it the next morning. And that's, that's my non-negotiable. Now you ask a great question about patience and, 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 um, and this idea now of kind of instant gratification. So here's my thing. The gift of having a spiritual practice, whether it's yoga nidra or prayer or meditation, however you do it, but the really one that, yeah, you can take a walk on the beach and it has its own kind of effect. There's lots of things we can do in the world that make us feel at home or more comfortable. But what's so superb about the more sublime practices, meditation and yoga nidra and, and prayer, contemplation, is that you begin to have a connection to a part of you that's not finite. That's not going, I'm just going to be frank, that's not going to die. That's not going to lose stuff. And when you have that relationship to the part of you that isn't temporary, you have a treasure, literally something priceless. Now, here's the deal. If you start having an experience with that part of you consistently, something very interesting happens. On the one hand, you start tapping into the source of your creativity. You, you tap into the source of ideas, imagination, possibility. You have more enthusiasm. You have more confidence. You have more um, self-value in your own eyes. Why? Because you're touching the part of you that's not at the mercy of circumstances to show you that you're okay. The boyfriend doesn't have to care for, you know, have to bring you flowers or pick you up at the airport. You start becoming more self-reliant. And gosh, you know, self-reliance is one of the great characteristics for human beings to develop. But the other part of it is you really become, you don't have this belief, the belief of what I'm about to describe. You have the living experience of it. And that is that you're not made better by any accomplishment. You're not made worse by any failure. Yes, there's disappointment. Yes, you'd prefer one thing than another. Yes, you aspire. But when you have a relationship to yourself such that your value is not dependent upon success, now you have the ultimate tool of patience. You have the ultimate tool of it's going to take how long it's going to take. So I don't have to have instant, self -grat instant gratification because I'm already full, the conditions are not going to actually change me. And you know, I mean, just speaking in real terms, if you, let's say you have a relationship, you know, I'm married, and let's just say that for whatever reason, your spouse doesn't think you're the greatest thing that day. What if you could hold on to your self-worth or self-value and not be reactive, but really show up? and say, this hurt my feelings, or I wasn't, I was, I was surprised by what happened between us, but your self-worth or self-value is not in any way depreciated by them not holding you in the highest esteem. And then you really, that's why I say, this is a priceless treasure, because then you begin to see, wow, I'm so tied into accomplishment as creating my value. I'm so tied into failure devaluing me. And the moment you, when you really start to liberate yourself from that, you start living differently. And so that's why it's my non-negotiable. Wow. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, people that listen to this know that I have a, the same non-negotiable. Now you guys know why to just hear <laughs> that. That's why. Um, so I, I just have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, if there is a piece of wisdom or advice that you have had your entire life, maybe it's like an 
uh, consistent mantra or the undertone that has guided you your entire life? If there is that one piece or, or thing that you've always had for the span of when you were born to now, is there one? And if there is, what is it? So I've never thought about this before. But as I reflect back, you know, pre-yoga, pre-initiation, pre-spirituality that's still even been sustained through that, I would say always be willing to learn. That's who I was early on, you know. And, and I'm, I'm not really talking about facts and history. I'm talking about self, learning about myself. I've always, I think that's a, for me it's always been a blessing. And it's why, um, and, it, and it's one of the reasons why, although I'm very sincere in my efforts in spirituality and teaching and stepping into those methodologies and things like that and then being such a part of my life, I've always been relatively uh, good at not taking myself too seriously. And it's because I just know the process of growth is never done. And, and, I, and I really, I, before I ever met a yoga teacher, my yoga teacher, I was already totally bought into the idea of always learn, always be willing to learn. What is your prayer for the younger generation? Um, I would say my prayer for the younger generation would be something along the lines of learn to know yourself or seek out who you are. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much that would have meant to me in my teen, teens, for example, or early 20s. But I do see, you know, I, I, in my early 20s, there were no answering machines. And I don't, I don't know if everyone gets what I'm saying. There were no answering machines. That means you, you weren't home, someone called you. There were no cell phones. Someone called you, you weren't home, and you might not hear from them for another four days, Okay. So, I can't believe how much you're laughing at that. That's really funny. Barely hold it together. Uh, so, but my point is that there's so many distractions now. And we're not happier. We're not happier with all these wonderful things. And so what I would say is like, look, the, the keys to happiness, whether you're 85 or you're 20, haven't changed. It's still coming to rest in yourself. It's still understanding the part of you that does not change. And there is a part of you that doesn't change. That's called soul or spirit or essence or God. So I'm ultimately, when as a yoga teacher, I'm in the happiness, I'm in the happiness business. I'm trying to help people be happier by showing them the way back to their home, back to their heart. And yes, it's easy to get distracted easier now that there are things along this technological iteration from mm -hmm. answering machines beyond. Get to know yourself. Take time. Because that is, there's a wealth in that, that no amount of technology, no, no iteration, no new development, no technological shift will happen that can replace resting in the essence of you. And, um, and, and lastly, what I would say is the happiness and the well-being of everyone else is actually dependent on each of us having a relationship to that self. Because the more elevated we are in our thinking, in our well-being, in our health, the more we'll make decisions, the more we'll say things, the more we'll react from a place of sustainability, of interrelatedness. So that's what I would say is, is uh, no matter how things change, that has not changed. Mm -hmm. That happiness is, a, is an inner game. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next is uh, lightning round. Okay. I thought that was the last one. So no, we no. get more with yeah, Rosie. Just Fantastic. Couple, just couple quick. What is freedom? Uh, not carrying burdens. What is love? 
Love is a verb. What does it mean to be a student? To be teachable. To never completely lose your innocence. And curiosity. What is your greatest wish for your children? Wow, you are good. You are, you are really good. Uh, that was a long pregnant pause. So uh, um, the greatest wish for my children is that they find that unique contribution they're meant to live and be and that they become increasingly fearless about living it. That they find who they are and they fall in love with who they are. Okay, this is the last question. Right. This is it. I ask all of my... Um... My people, this, this is special uh, in case you guys haven't gathered this. This is, uh, this is such an honor to be with my teacher. And uh, I'm going to just stop there because if not, we'll be here forever because I'll start to cry and then I won't be able to compose myself. Um, I built this platform as a way to cultivate a community for people to come to um, I called it Radically Loved because I believe that there is uh, a power greater than ourselves. There is God or whatever higher power of your understanding that holds this, this planet, this world together. And that the universe works for us and not against us. And it's of the belief that we're all radically loved. And so the question to you is it's twofold. The first one is how do you feel radically loved? And the second is, what do you radically love? Radically loved is, is acceptance. And it's being seen. And embraced for who I am. With all the colors. All the... Nice stuff and not so nice stuff, I guess, you know, that's still left. It's, it's, it's really about acceptance. Uh, so part two is, I radically love the journey and the, uh, or the process of discovery, particularly between people. It's also in my spiritual practice, but there's almost certainty in that. There's almost comfort in that. But there's so many variables when we start relating to each other. So I radically love the adventure of learning to love. Thank you so much, Yoga Rupa Rat Stryker, uh, my teacher. He's the most amazing human being on the planet. Um, so for those people that want more information uh, about you and uh, everything that you have to offer, uh, where can they go for, for all of that? Simplest way is rodstriker.com, and uh, that'll connect them to the yoga we're doing. Or go search uh, the app store for um, Sanctuary, the uh, Sanctuary with Rod Striker. Which, if you're interested in anything that we spoke about during this talk, you'll have so many answers on that app. If you want yoga nidra practices, meditations, other talks that uh, Yoga Rupa has given, you can get them all there. And there's also an info button. If you're listening to this on your device, you can go to the show notes and all of the links that everything that we talked about today will be on there. So be sure to do that. And uh, once again, I just want to take a moment to uh, say thank you for being just a guiding light in my life and for being a part of this 
community and for you know everything that you've done for me and for all of your students and for the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there something missing in your life? Is there something that you want to do in the world to create an impact but feel that it's overwhelming? So many of us walk through life feeling unsatisfied, overwhelmed, tired, and desperate for a deeper connection, but don't quite know how to achieve the things that we want in life. Join us this spring at the Dunsky Castle in Scotland for seven days of yoga, meditation, and yoga nidra, all focusing on finding your life's purpose. During our time together, we will learn how and when to take action, how to lead from our heart and not our head, how to break up with our inner critic for good and dive deep into learning about desire and discipline and how this creates a purposeful life. For more information, go to radicallyloved.com or you can message us at info at radicallyloved.com, subject Scotland. We'll see you soon. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I am so excited to continue to do this. Please share this with your friends. Email us, message us on Instagram at Rosie Acosta or on Twitter at Rosie Acosta. Subscribe on iTunes, write a review. We love doing this, so please help us continue to keep this podcast going. Thanks for listening.